Aloha, my name is Julie Mitchell and I'm the Executive Director here at Kuikahi Mediation Center. Welcome to our Finding Solutions Growing Peace Brown Bag Lunch Series. Uh, Kuikahi is a nonprofit community mediation center and we serve East Hawaii on the Big Island or Hawaii Island. We were founded back in 1983, so we're celebrating our 40th birthday this year. And we were a, a program of the Island of Hawaii YMCA when we first started. And then back in 2006, we became our own independent nonprofit organization. Our mission is to empower people to come together, to talk and to listen, to explore options and to find their own best solutions. To achieve this mission, we offer mediation, facilitation, and training like today's brown bag to strengthen the ability of diverse individuals and groups to resolve interpersonal conflicts and community issues. Our brown bag lunch series is held every third Thursday at 12 noon on Zoom. And we do record it each time. If you can't make it, you can still sign up. Just register on Eventbrite each time to receive the Zoom link. I'm excited about our next uh, presenter on December 21st is Deanna Parrish. She's with the Harvard uh, Law School. Law School uh, Law. I, I, I'm not going to try to do the whole um, title because I'm going to mess it up. Anyways, her topic is going to be designing eviction mediation as a tool for violence reduction. And I'll put the link to register in the chat. Okay. Also, I want to, I'm going to keep talking about this until it happens. Our next basic mediation training is starting on Friday, February 23rd in the new year. It's a four-day interactive training here in Hilo. It's perfect for folks who want to communicate more effectively, personally and professionally, become a better negotiator and problem solver, and increase your value in the workplace. Whether you want to enhance your communication skills or become a volunteer mediator here at Kuikahi, this training gives you the tools you need to start resolving conflict in peaceful, lasting ways. And I will also put the link for our annual basic mediation training in the chat if you wanna check, click into it and check that out. At the end of today's talk, we will ask you to fill out a short online survey, which I will put a link to in the chat box. This helps with our grant funding for this free series. And please take a moment to give us your thoughts. I'll also send out an email later with the slides, the video link, and also the survey link in case you have any problems clicking into it during today's Zoom. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's topic, When Ideology Blocks Action, Name It, Discuss It, and Act, as well as our presenter, Kimberly Dark, who has consulted in conflict resolution and facilitation for over 20 years. She is an award-winning author and storyteller who works to reveal the hidden architecture of everyday life so that we can reclaim our power as social creators. Her ability to make the personal political is grounded in her training as a sociologist, and she teaches in sociology at Cal State San Marcos and in writing arts at Cal State Summer Arts. Kimberly lives on Hawaii Island when she's not traveling about doing these other fabulous things. Welcome, Kimberly. Thanks, Julie. It's always a pleasure. It's good to see all of you folks. I love when everybody tumbles into the Zoom room. It's very exciting. Um, so, so hey, um, we're here to talk about how ideologies block action, um, but I'm going to tell you a little story first, um, and a little bit more about some of the some of the other work that I do. So, yeah, for like God, Julie just said the last 20 years, but more like the last 30 years now, I've been either teaching sociology or facilitating. Um, and researching community-based collaborative work toward equity and inclusion or helping people with conflict, um, those kinds of things and, and writing as well. So people invite me to speaking engagements. So last year, uh, the Virginia Military Institute wanted me to come and be their gender equity speaker. And I said, yeah, cool. But they wanted me to know that they would understand if I didn't want to come because there have been some people that really, really did not want me there. In fact, there had been threats and they said they would provide me an escort on campus, but you know, they would understand if I didn't want to come. Um, of course, I still wanted to come, 
And I tried not to focus on that because listen, I am old enough to remember when being queer as I am and talking about LGBTQ issues was enough to bring out protesters on some campuses where I've spoken and earned me a police escort, which is also not always a comfortable thing, right? I mean, how do those officers feel about queer folks? So while it is not my first time saying yes to an engagement like this, it's also never nice to be greeted by people who want to do harm. So just so you understand via my a little bit, like why would they do, why would that be the case at Virginia Military Institute? Um, the Supreme Court actually forced them to accept women to attend VMI in 1997. Like, think about this. Those first 30 women were the class of 2001. Like, that's not very long ago. Um, at that time, the superintendent and the cadets and the alums, they put forth a united front. No, they absolutely did not want women on their campus. It was a united front. Um, incidentally, they were the last public college in the United States to racially integrate as well. Um, five, I imagine very lonely black men joined an all white campus in 1968. I'm just saying, I'm, you know, I'm pointing out these dates because like that's in my lifetime. These are not, you know, ancient history kind of things but it's a public school. <laughs> so they they had to make these changes according to the Supreme Court. So this is where I'm gonna start talking about ideology. So think about ideology is a system of ideas and ideals that often go on to form policy. So think about for a moment how ending slavery of Africans in the United States did not suddenly manufacture goodwill toward black Americans. Now, the ideology of diminished humanity was already in place and was gonna stay in place for a long time. So just like that, the ideology that women are inferior is still in place at VMI as well. Because it's only, you know, since 2001 that that first group of women graduated there. So everything, of course, is going to reflect that. Even as policies change, institutional supports change, individual language and daily interaction will support ideology, not policy. Right? That is until it doesn't. And that takes time. And it takes commitment to policies that, you know, do these things that not everybody likes. So this is why people like me are invited to travel and talk is to help move things along. So what I found that evening at VMI was a dedicated staff of diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals. I found faculty and staff who really wanted to support their students. I also found cadets, that's what they call their students, male and female, and I know not what else, who earnestly were trying to grapple with the traditions of their school. Because remember, these folks love tradition and protocol and hierarchy is built into the very fabric of what a military institute does. So like, how do you leave all of that in place and take it apart at the same time? That's, that's the question. And, and that's honestly, we're going to get to this in a moment. This is the question for all of us, because all of us are working in various settings with dominant ideologies that do not serve the nobler aims that we have for the places we work and live. So in my presentation there at VMI, I did what I do. I offered stories of hope and kindness and celebration of difference. And I offered stories in which individuals could locate themselves, even though I'm different than they are. And I offered um, blueprints for individual and social change that even though they're not totally transferable uh, to every situation, they are actual proof that people have changed for the better before, and we can all do it again and again and again. In fact, that's precisely what we need to do, both alone and in concert. So VMI did offer me a police escort while I was on campus, but we didn't see any trouble. My haters didn't show up, though they scoured the internet to find out everything they could hate about my life. They offered vitriol about me online and on radio talk shows for weeks to come. 
Um, but they didn't come to the event. And interestingly, they also declined to watch the video of the event. One lone professor came to question me at the end of the talk saying that he thought people like me were nonsense and frivolous and what cadets really needed was more discipline. I asked the students that were surrounding us to respond to his questions about my content and they were really good at it. And they confirmed that I am genuinely interested in how traditions can be both honored and changed. Because this is our task as I see it. So that campus is facing some serious challenges and the Washington Post wrote about my visit and their ongoing coverage of VMI because the superintendent who happens to be the first black superintendent that school has ever had was even asked to step down for uh, the crime of inviting me among other perceived wrongs. Obviously, I'm still thinking about this event, right? But here's why I'm telling you this story. They are not the only group facing challenges. And the advantage they have, as I see it, is that they can openly name those challenges. So many of us, I think, are operating in environments where people claim to be anti-racist and yet still do racist things. Maybe they can't even see them but they do things that negatively impact people of color. So many of us operate in environments where equity is actually in the charter and yet does not include queer people, for instance, or fat people or disabled people, because you know either our troubles are our own fault or we're, um, we're big perverts or, or it's just too dang hard, right? Like there's lots of reasons why people feel like well, we want equity except for them, whoever the them happens to be. So those students at VMI asked me outright, how do we honor tradition and at the same time force change? It's a paradox, um, but to the extent that those traditions often revolve around concepts like excellence, I think that we can do that by continuing to revise what excellence means. So think about that. We do it all the time, actually, continuing to revise concepts like excellence. So here's an example. I don't know if any of you ever watch figure skating, like at the Olympics, like couples figure skating. I think it's amazing, right? Like amazing athleticism and artistry. But now you can go and Google couples figure skating in like the Olympics in 1923, let's just say. You could Google that, I mean, have a look later once I've planted this idea in your mind. I wanna just tell you, it looks like what kids do at ice rinks now. Like what they were doing at the Olympics looks like what children are now doing at ice rinks. Excellence has been redefined. Like even by 1973, Olympic figure skaters were just getting off the ground, right? They were just starting to do lifts. You know, and that's what we expect in, in those shows now are like lots of flips and lifts and, you know, airborne stuff. So by 73, it still looked, it was a different standard of excellence than what that looks like today. But as you look at those examples across time, you still can see the traditions of the sport. You still can recognize the sport. So, Here's the deal, policies have to be like a train on the track to better days, even when individuals don't like all the stops on the route. I'm gonna say that again, just to sink it in. Policies have to be like a train on the track to better days, even when individuals don't like all the stops on the route. So the kind of resistance they have at VMI, I think can help us to think about this and to name problems and work with them overtly. Um, honestly, I honor their struggles there at that campus and I look to them for guidance in some ways. So we all have to keep naming what is not right in the communities, the organizations that we work with, and also elevating the voices of people who can see those failed intentions and implementation because they live the consequences of them, right? Like 
like whenever I see one of those, uh, you know, surveys that's like, I don't know if you've ever seen this. I mean, it happens periodically that there's like a, a survey done that says like, oh, 54%, I'm making these numbers up right now, but you know, like, oh, 54% of white people say there's no more racism in America. <laughs> and then the number of, you know, people of color who say there's no racism in America is extremely low because those people have different perspectives and you cannot ask white people, is there racism in America? And then act on just that, it, it, it doesn't work. So we have to keep, you know, looking to the people who can see those schisms between our intentions and our successes. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some slides now so that we can keep talking about this. And let's just, give me a second. To do the thing. All right. Can you see the slide on the screen now? Okay. Got a thumbs up from Julie. Um, so we're talking about naming it, discussing it at ACT. But hang on. People don't like to change. And besides, tradition is good. Right? So let's just think about a few things here. Ideologies are embedded in cultural institutions and in individual everyday interactions. That's important to know. People can superficially agree that equity is good and then still not be capable of enacting it because of ideological conflicts. And then lastly, this is something really to think about, those who are not in favor of change sometimes will carry the banner of tradition causing those who might learn new ways to remain stuck in the past. So this is one of the, you know, cause I don't know if this, if you've ever noticed this before, but sometimes it's really uncomfortable when somebody starts saying, yes, but this is the way we've always done it. And wow, wasn't it great when everybody was gathered around like this and this beautiful thing happened and that beautiful thing happened. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't, you know, right. So, what I am advocating for in this time that we have together is the ability to see and speak about these moments of disconnect with our intentions. And I'm not pretending there's some easy way to do that. Like there's absolutely not an easy way to do that. But it is literally intention and action and practice over time that creates our ability to do that, right? So the first thing is, you know, to develop and recommit again and again to our intentions. All right, so I'm gonna show you a few um, scenarios and I would love it if you happen to have uh, like a pen and paper with you um, that you can think about I mean, maybe it's helpful to just think about one setting in your life. Um, somebody's weed whacking outside now. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Okay, I think maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one vexed by the external noise. So, so if you keep a note, um, like let's say uh, if you work on a college campus or you have a certain workplace or you're part of an HOA or you're part of an organization, you just think of a, a particular place and then you know make some notes for where you notice some of what I'm discussing. Um, and you can use my examples too, as you make notes. And by the way, this, um, you know, what I'm discussing with you today is uh, modified from a longer workshop um, that is for folks on college campuses. So you're going to see that some of my examples, because I've used real examples in these scenarios you're about to see, um, but some of them are on college campuses because that's, um, you know, that's where I'm mostly operating with these conversations. So here's our task as we look at some of these scenarios. Is there a schism between ideology and action in your group or your workplace or your campus, whatever it happens to be? So the next slides offer some scenarios. And here's what you're going to jot down if you have a pen and paper handy. Can you add more? Can you add additional ways that you see the gap between ideology and action? 
can you identify which scenarios are primarily personal versus primarily institutional? And this is a trick question, kind of, because they're all always both. But, you know, sometimes one is, uh, you know, more than the other. Okay, so scenario one. Let's say you work somewhere really progressive and there is a diversity, equity, and inclusion department or staff person, or maybe even just a set of policies at your workplace. Like that's pretty, that's pretty powerful and big. But let's say you still notice maybe that it took a really long time to hire the director and people often question her credentials or abilities or orientation to the work. Or maybe you see that events are not always well promoted or have a hard time finding prime spaces or times to be held when folks are talking about diversity. Or maybe you notice that the staff are trying to do too much. Like maybe they have like 3000 things on their to-do list and there is sustained understaffing. It's not just taking place for a little while. Maybe a lot of time is spent just justifying programming or writing responses to detractors or setting up safety protocols for students, speakers, and staff. I think about that visit to VMI and how much time that department who invited me had to spend, first of all, ensuring my safety, but secondly, just responding to the constant um, detractors that happened before my visit, after my visit. Huh? So you might think of a lesser version of that, but maybe you still see some of these things. Or how about staff with advanced degrees are often not introduced as such, or when other people's backgrounds or accomplishments are being acknowledged, theirs are admitted, omitted. Like sometimes this is like not, it's not um, intentional, but if it is repetitive, we have to pay attention to it. Or maybe people of color and women are often discussed using their first names while men and white people are called by a title or their last names. I just wanna tell you as somebody who's been a professor for many years, I can't tell you how many times I have said to students, just because this particular writer is a woman, you don't refer to her by her first name. You refer to her by her last name, just like you did with all the men we were reading before her. So, Discussions about race, critical race theory, white supremacy in the U.S. Maybe you notice that those are often left only for particular staff people to discuss and that others do not meaningfully contribute. Or maybe you notice that discussions about racism often admit, oh, omit, omit discussions of active white supremacy. Just to, just to clarify what I mean there, sometimes we talk about racism as though no one is doing the racism, like it's, a, it's passively mentioned, as opposed to having a discussion about the actions of white supremacy, that, that it is literally um, a process that has people involved in doing it. So this is scenario one. So if you think about the places where you operate, um, whether it's your workplace or a community group, maybe some of these are sort of a fit, or maybe you can think of others where there is an intention in one direction, but then there is sort of like, hey, wait, not everyone is participating in this intention. And you know, sometimes it's not even like, it would be too much to ask that everyone be participating, but maybe some people are not even speaking up when stuff goes wrong here, right? You can see that some of this here is really stuff going wrong if the intention is to have diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I just want to pause here and see if anyone has questions or comments about this scenario or about I mean, I guess really about anything that I've said so far regarding ideology and how we still need to, you know, flex the muscle of naming and discussing things, even if there's a policy in place. You can click your raise hand button if you'd like. 
You can also use the chat, that's okay. All right, I see some things in the chat, right? This is great. And everybody has access to, uh, you know, to looking at these comments in the chat. So similar pattern with voting in presidential election regarding race and gender. Okay. Fiddler on the roof comes to mind regarding traditions of change. Very good. There's good, good, good catchy tunes about change there. All right, New Hampshire moving its primary vote date. So more diverse South Carolina does not vote first. The governor said it's a great tradition. So this is excellent. The things that you are posting here are precisely the kind of thinking um, that I'm encouraging. And I'm, I'm heartened to see, um, you know, to see some of these things. Yeah, the difference between lip service, check off boxes versus actions. All right, and we have um, Darlene, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, there's one thing I would like to say. Um, I am in, an, in a clinical association and we had a terrible time about where our conference for the year, our annual conference was going to be held, whether it should be held in Florida or not, given what was going on there, and given how many of our members in the clinical society had issues with what was going on there. And uh, when I tried to speak up about it, I was shut down. And so I decided to run for the board. And I thought, well, you know, this is it, you know, uh, if if I get on the board, then people are serious about these issues and really do want to address them. And if I don't get on the board, then maybe I just shouldn't be involved in this association because they're not serious about their policies. And I was voted onto the board and I was very heartened and surprised by that because I, you know, the way I was shut down so, so severely, I really didn't think it was going to happen, but it happened. This is a great example of how speaking up about things and then going like, wait a minute, <laughs> no, I, I, do people really care about this? Like you actually took the next step of going, well, wait, if there's support of these views, then, uh, you know, then maybe I can make a difference on the board. That's an excellent example. Thank you for sharing that. I hope it goes well. <laughs> All right, we've got one comment in here um, in the, oh, we've got a few more comments in the chat and I'm gonna take just a couple of them so that I can move on and get in one more scenario for you here. There seems to be some assumptions presented as facts. Also racism often goes both ways, but one direction is not acceptable by society to mention. So Franz, you can speak for yourself, but I'm gonna just go ahead and you know, see if I can understand what you're saying. Um, you're talking about what people call reverse racism. And I wanna point out that racism actually is a structural issue, right? So a person in every scenario, people have relative power or relative lack of power. So this is how social hierarchy works. So there will be moments when I have a, a relative power because of a certain position that I hold or a degree that I have or a book that I've written. There will also be moments when I have a relative lack of power because I'm a woman, because I'm queer, because, uh, because I lack a certain degree or a certain kind of education. The thing when we talk about racism though, is that that is a structural issue. Whereas if somebody is discriminated against for being white, that is a personal issue because there is not structural power behind the act of discrimination. So totally possible for somebody to be discriminated against if you are of any race, but Particular, particular structural issues, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about like this scenario with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so we've got a few more of these. I'm You know what I'm gonna do? Um, got another, 
Yeah, so somebody's commenting on promoting diversity and equity on a campus and Juneteenth is not a holiday at the school, but Cesar Chavez Day is. Um, and so you're seeing, right, that certain groups have more support than others, even though um, all of these groups, you know, have uh, issues that they need recognized. Very nice. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on because time is of the essence, but I am appreciating all of these comments. Thank you, Franz. You don't think anyone is free of racism. I also don't think that, right? We are socialized in, um, you know, there is white supremacy is embedded in our nation and our origins. And so I, I feel that, you know, to the extent that I contain racist ideologies, I will spend the rest of my life, if I am diligent, undoing what my culture has given me in that regard. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead to another scenario. I hope this is useful to you all and then this will give us enough time for some more comments after the next one. I have to close the chat, which I'm so fascinated by looking at. Damn it. This is the problem with Zoom is that you, I, you, know, you can't do too many things at once. Okay. I'm gonna use scenario two as well. So this one is about disabled people having accommodations that minimally meet ADA requirements. So I, I hope you all know what the ADA is, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that got some inclusion for some disabled people that, you know, like we were, the U.S. as a nation was ahead of the curve for a lot of nations when the ADA was passed. We've fallen back a little bit in terms of, you know, how people are accommodated. But like, just think about, make some notes for your own scenarios. So um, maybe there is support for people with disabilities, but you also notice that the needs of specific people may still be unaddressed. Or you notice that discussions about disability are often led by a veteran services office, and they focus only on the needs framed by that group. This is true on a lot of college campuses these days, where um, disability rights are often only championed by veteran services. Um, how about this one? The screensaver on all of the library and public computers include an inspirational quote that reads, there is no elevator to success, you have to take the stairs. That was actually my campus. Um, and, and this is troubling, right? Because if we say that we support people with disabilities and access, then we have to notice the ways that discrimination are embedded in common language. So there is no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. For me, this is problematic in a number of ways because heck yeah, there's elevators to success. Wealth is a big one. <laughs> I mean, so this is like not even true in, um, in a number of ways, but it certainly is insulting to people who cannot walk upstairs. Uh, or maybe here's, here's one that was also a real example. Classes begin at seven in most buildings on campus, but campus police don't begin work until eight. And they are the ones responsible for unlocking the elevators for everyone's use. Can you see how this is an institutional schism that moves against the intention of accessibility, which is literally a policy right, that students have to have access to the classes that they take and professors have to have access to their work. Um, but but here's, here's this thing, these people don't come to work until an hour later. Oh, here's a nice one, a club held a fundraiser in which everyone dressed up crazy for a certain event. Costumes included inmate attire, uncombed hair and blood smears, which think about this, indicates violence. Right. So I grew up in a time period. In fact, I believe that I even went as Halloween as a crazy person once when I was, I don't know, 10 years old, maybe. Um, and yeah, the idea of the old institution in which crazy people lived and they're just crazy and they belong there. But we accept that those are violence producing institutions. That's deep. Right. So how do we move against these kind of images. 
And the last example, some people talk about disabled people as though they're not in the room, but also others rarely intervene. So you might make some notes and see if there are similar scenarios regarding disability in your particular group or uh, workplace or school or whatever the thing may be. So just making some notes. And if you would like to say anything in the chat, you can, or raise a hand uh, thinking about this scenario. I'm also going back to one of the other comments in the chat from uh, before, where Ben says, I'm interested in labeled purported ideologies like woke, that basically means whatever I don't like, even if I don't really have a clue where it came from or what it might mean. Um, this is a great example and thing to talk about, right? Like when we think about, um, you know, woke is really just, a, I mean, it's a, it's a shift on the word awakened as in understanding something. So, you know, like the example I always like to think about when people start talking about the word woke is like how, <laughs> if somebody knows how to fix a toaster uh, or, you know, fix a small appliance in the kitchen, they probably know enough mechanically to fix other little things. Right. Maybe not a car engine, but, you know, if you, maybe you can fix the toaster. You could also fix a hairdryer. I don't know. I'm just I'm just guessing here. Knowledge is transferable. Right. So I would say that that person is woke to small electronics in a way that I am not. <laughs> right. I cannot. I don't have information at all, let alone that I can transfer to other places. So as a sociologist, this sort of thing comes up quite a bit. I understand things about social inequality. I am woke to how social inequality works, and therefore I can apply my knowledge across a variety of situations and scenarios. So this is so interesting how um, it absolutely, you know, is true, right? That woke has come to mean whatever I don't like. This is precisely the scenario in which we need to name the problem, discuss it, and to be willing to not um, limit progress based on, I simply don't like it. I'm seeing a few more comments here. Yeah, often policies regarding disabilities are created by people without the disabilities. This is precisely the issue that we have to constantly be asking the question, are we really involving the voices of people with lived experience? And you know, the disability justice movement brought us a great phrase that is applicable across other issues as well. And that is nothing about us without us. You might have heard that before, and that is uh, you know, a gift to us from the disability justice movement. Nothing about us without us. Um, Darlene says, I think organizations are actually better at this one than the other scenario. Well, if that is true, it is because of the ADA. And we would have to ask a variety of disabled people in a certain scenario in order to know whether that's true for that particular organization. But yes, this the ADA is a great example of how once a policy becomes embedded, it can do good work over and over again through different um, scenarios, different locations. And, um, and, and then pretty soon we take for granted, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this uh, reference to like when curb cuts, right? Where you can roll up, uh, you know, there's not a curb for to stop the wheelchair. You can roll up. Um, this, this phenomenon is actually called now the curb cut effect because by accommodating people who use wheelchairs, 
Who else was accommodated? People who use strollers, uh, delivery people who have to, you know, use a dolly to get their goods into a certain business. Um, people who use other assistive devices like canes. Um, so the idea that uh, somehow um, accommodations for a small group do not benefit all, it's, it's wrong, right? And the curb cut effect is one, one way to discuss that. Um, heard on NPR recently that Hawaii has been voted the number one state in terms of inclusivity. Um, I, you know what, I, I have not read that entire study, but I think I heard the same um, HPR <laughs> thing that you did. Um, it's a really interesting one, and I would love to know more about what, you know, what specifically they were looking at. Um, I also want to say, too, that, you know, being the best at something that the larger group is really bad at is you know it's not like it's not a laurel to rest on no so uh so i think you know i think yay us right when people say oh there's less racism because it doesn't look like racism in the u.s or there's less uh you know discrimination against lgbt folks because maybe it looks different we have to talk about that some more um, yeah, some great examples here. Opening doors on their own. Your college campus has access everywhere, but at the workplace, it's very difficult. Excellent example. I'm so sorry you're dealing with that. Policies are passed by people who do not have or have experienced the things that are said in policies. I think sometimes that's true, but not always, right? Because a lot of times, Progress is prompted by the people who need it the most. Um, we have to come up with a way in which policies are passed in correlation with those who have, ex yes, absolutely, who have experienced those things. Absolutely. A rise in sea level raises all boats. Yes, Darlene, another way to say that. All right. So, Julie, what is your opinion here? We are at 1245. Shall we look at one more scenario? Or shall we uh, see what else we get here? In um, comments. Well, I mean, I'm interested in doing whatever you think would be due. I'm also interested in thinking, uh, hearing more about your thoughts about the act part about what do we do about this stuff? I don't know if that's part of your, your answer. We've got, what, uh, 15 more minutes. So take it away. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I hope that I've been sort of addressing this throughout. There is not like, I, I can't give you a script for how do you talk about these things and how do you act? But the way that you do that is by making a commitment and then trying it and then practicing it, right? Literally those three things. The, the commitment has to be there. That let's say, let's say you are focused on disability justice and the, the commitment has to be there that you are going to interrupt every single one of those things that you see if you are capable. And then you see how that goes and you see what action looks like. Because as people are saying here, you know, Look, there are no saviors. It's not like it's not like uh, it's up to one group to save another. It's that we become liberated together, right? And so, if we are all working, you know, in concert for our own liberation, but how do you know somebody else is doing that? Because they've said something, because they've spoken up, you know. Sometimes the person in the room that has the lived experience is actually the one that is most vulnerable. And that's why they are not speaking up in a certain moment, right? So I wanna tell you, this is part of my practice and it's not perfect, right? We're gonna screw things up, but the good news is human culture was made by humans. So <laughs> it's a, we're gonna screw it up, but we're gonna fix it. So I look for that. I look for moments when someone seems uncomfortably silenced and I might just ask, gosh, is there something else that we're not seeing about this? What about blah, blah? And then, you know, we can see what comes then from, from those folks. All right, we're gonna look at just one more scenario because I'm feeling it. 
Uh, and like I said, I've got six scenarios here. We're just going to look at three today. So um, this one's about gender. Gender equity is maybe widely discussed as important where you work or live or operate. And people receive training about how to handle witnessing or hearing allegations of sexual violence, for instance. But still you notice that women are rarely believed when they discuss dating abuse, hate speech against women or rape, or their tentative comments are dismissed as too bad or just the way it is, or what did she expect or things like this. You might notice that. Uh, you might notice very few women are in leadership positions at any level, especially at the top of your organizations or groups. Their lack is particularly concentrated like on a college campus in things like administration or medicine or sports or science. Um, you might notice too that women are often in leadership positions in nonprofits and uh, those are somewhat less respected roles sometimes when compared to things like medicine and sports and science. Uh, professional expectations of women still include things like wearing makeup, foundation clothing. Um, that's things like bras and shapewear <laughs> and appearing feminine, that these are still expectations for professional attire. Um, I, I know it's like it's shocking to even talk about foundation clothing because most women would not even consider going to work without a bra on if, you know, if they've got boobs at all. But the fact is that is a body modification that is about gender conformity. And yet it is so invisible that we just go, well, of course, of course, uh, of course I wear a bra, what are you talking about? Um, specific needs of women are rarely discussed or they are outright erased. For instance, women of color, trans women, women with unstable housing, women with histories of trauma or assault by men. You might notice that, that while we're going, yay, girl boss, there are specific people who are left out of the conversation. Um, gender essentialism leads to the erasure of trans and non-binary people. You might notice that. You might notice people openly mocking or joking about women's intelligence. You remember the, remember the dumb blonde jokes? There's versions of those today too, right? And those were primarily addressed to women. Um, or an individual's right to define gender and pronoun usage or the violence rate against additionally stigmatized groups like sex workers or cross-dressers. People make jokes about these groups still uh, without anyone speaking up. Um, and then here's another campus example, a literary club that publishes a zine on road trips put out by a Halloween, put out a Halloween horror themed call for writing on dead hookers in the gas station bathroom. This is an example of openly mocking certain groups of people. So make some notes, see where do you see gender inequity I know that it is really tempting to focus on, okay, what's the action that fixes this? But I'm really encouraging us to stop thinking about that before we have even trained ourselves to notice what the devil is happening when we say we want gender equity and then we don't do it. So this is like, train yourself to notice something first. Speak up, give it a try, and then practice. Any comments or questions about anything that I've offered you today or the, the scenario regarding gender in particular? <laughs> so it says, I love the bras with nipples that are out there to rebel against undergarment requirements. I had not ever thought about those nipple bras as a rebellion, but that's a wonderful framing of that, um, rebelling against undergarment requirements. I always thought of it as a way to like, have the right shape, but titillate somebody nonetheless. I don't know. <laughs> so many fascinating things that we don't even unpack in our daily lives that, um, you know, that support hierarchy in ways that we think we want to be done with. Um, are you seeing gender? 
representation and um, maligning in your areas. Someone has said much too much attention and money is spent on college football and football is almost exclusively male players. Uh, I agree. You know, when you take a look at the Chronicle of Higher Education does, uh, does a um, study, you know, a, a survey every year about uh, who's paid most on college campuses. And it is, it is precisely um, football coaches, uh, medical directors, and sometimes administration. It is precisely those groups. And that is indeed a statement about what we value. And folks will say, well, that's who's bringing the money into the campus. But again, is that what we value? <laughs> is that the most important thing that a campus does is to earn money for itself? Um, very interesting questions, right? There may not be an immediate answer to these questions, but we are all the better when we practice discussing them. Anything else right now? I know these scenarios are a little overwhelming and I want to acknowledge that, right? Some of you might be thinking like, wow, wow we just went from like uh, race to disability to gender and like there's all these things and like, oh, but... <laughs> you know, back to the example of like being woke about small appliances, you literally can get yourself woke about noticing social inequality. Like it doesn't take much. In fact, this is one of the things that students in social inequality courses often talk about is like, oh my God, now I can't unsee it. Now that I've, you know, now that I've been exposed to this, I can't unsee it, it's everywhere. And that I think is a good thing. So brain injury gets more empathy it seems than does domestic violence. Well, yes. So back to the idea of a hierarchy of disabilities. Um, you know, like there's a reason why that was funny and allowable for me to wear that mental inmate costume as a 10 year old child. But you wouldn't wear the costume of someone with a brain injury, would you? Um, ACLU recently won a case where female athletes were not allowed to wear sports bras in a hundred plus weather, but guys could run shirtless. Whew. I didn't see that one, but go see it. ACLU. How are they connected in a sociological point? I, I need more information, Naomi, for that question. Feel free to unmute yourself or to type more if you have it. Okay. I'm going to go on to my last slide here that just says thanks and, you know, has a little info on me and my website here as well. Um, I just want to invite you all to sign up for the free newsletter that I do called the Hope Desk, um, which, you know, has some tools and inspiration. You can find that um, sign up on the homepage of my website. And, um, and if you haven't already, you can uh, check out my most recent books. Those two are listed right here. Oh, wait, I think, I think there's more in the chat. Looking into the gender equity, how we change socially. And Julie is giving you a short online survey. You should help them out with that. So in our last couple minutes here, does anyone have any questions for Kimberly? We have a couple minutes if anyone wanted to um, raise your hand. I feel like Oh, sorry. sorry, Naomi offered a clarification for her question. Oh, pardon so me. That's okay. I can address that. I think looking into gender equity and how we change socially. So, you know, look, there's a lot of ways to look at things sociologically, right? Looking with the sociological imagination. But I think here's a thing that's important to remember is that we are constantly 
in a culture that's changing. And it looks like it stays the same for a really long time when you're working on something specifically, right? It looks like, oh my God, this is like never going to change and it's always going to suck. But the fact is, change is what cultures do. And it happens in part because individuals believe and behave in certain ways, but sometimes it happens quickly, right? Sometimes it happens slowly. Um, so I, I guess my point in bringing that up about individuals is that it matters what individuals do and say. Like it matters even if you're only talking to one other person or um, having a little small discussion at your book group or, you know, at lunch, at work. It matters the kind of conversations we have because humans affect one another. We think about the things that we have heard from people who are significant to us and, uh, and we behave differently as a result. Um, the writer Ursula Le Guin comment, I'm going to paraphrase what she said, but, you know, she pointed out that, you know, at one time very recently, the reign of kings was completely normal and nobody could imagine another way. And then all of a sudden, um, the way that we do government shifted dramatically. I like to think also of um, marriage equality is another example for me. Um, I did not think I would see that in my lifetime, that in the United States, people of the same um, sex could be married. And what happened there was that we had an ideological shift that happened for a huge groundswell of people and then brought the policies along behind it, right? The policies came as a result of people saying, you know, no, we're not, we're not doing it like this anymore. So it really does matter um, the ways in which we uh, name things, discuss them, and act. But start with the naming, start with noticing. Um, that's a good step in the right direction. It's a pleasure to be with y'all. Thanks, Julie. Thank you for coming today. We really appreciate you. I know we could have many more sessions with you. <laughs> so, you know, you have such a breadth and wealth of knowledge. And I want to thank everyone for being here today. If you don't mind to click in on that survey and just fill that out, we would really appreciate it. And I, I put the survey link several times in the chat. Um, do check your emails um, for the slides, the video link, and the survey link, uh, which we'll send out either today or tomorrow. And we hope to see you next month for our next topic on December 21st, Di uh, Deanna Parrish on the topic, Designing Eviction Mediation as a Tool for Violence Reduction. Uh, sh should be very interesting based on her and another person's research um, around the country. Have a great day. And thank you so much, Kimberly. We appreciate you being here. Pleasure.